The everyday mind assumes that the scientists have explored every corner of the Earth, but it's quite the contrary. Our planet still holds many secrets and unexplained mysteries, most of them hidden in plain sight. The basic facts are that 65% of our planet is unexplored and 95% of the water content remains a mystery to us. Yes, that means there still can be mermaids. Why haven't we yet mapped out the ocean? It's for one a simple reason. It is really tough. Think of the ocean as exploring a heavy dark mass of liquid atmosphere not much different from mapping outer space. But all that said and done, we have a story which follows an instance where one discovery led to the finding of something mythical, living, alien and above all, extraordinary hidden in the watery depths of Lake Ontario. It all started in August of 2017. A research team is setting up for a new expedition. They arrived at the Lake Ontario in Canada. Deep inside the lake there reportedly lies a piece of Canadian history. This is an object so special that bringing it back to land will put the eyes of the world on the shores of the lake. It won't be easy to find, even less easy to recover. But if they can do it, this struggle will be forgotten in the euphoria. Welcome to Mission Race the Arrow. Who is behind this daring rescue attempt? The team is working for an OEX Recovery Group Incorporated. Our treasure is in safe hands. Rescuing debris in distress is what the company does. They are associated with Canadian financial and mining outfits. Together, they work to recover lost objects from Lake Ontario. The rumor that there was something of immense value drowned in the lake waters soon reached viewers of OEX. Upon hearing the intriguing story, they got straight to work picking a team to dig up the truth. This legend tells of the objects so unique, so important, so valuable that they had to be found as soon as possible. The Raise the Arrow mission was created with the sole purpose of bringing this dream to fruition. It would be a discovery that would rock the world. OEX was eager to be the spearhead of such an important project. Providing the funding and resources for the mission would ensure that their name would be synonymous with that of the objects found. The aim of the project was simple. The team would search the places on the lake's bed where they were most likely to be found. The objects might prove too hidden to discover, or they might be too entrenched to bring up to the surface, and worst of all, they might not even be there. Due to all of this, such projects cost huge money. Thankfully, in this instance, the funds were there, but the pressure on the team to deliver was staggering. OEX and its associated companies were betting with some long odds. But would they see the horse come home? It was a picturistic lake. Around the team's boat, the water was crystal clear, revealing a silent, the worldly come. Occasionally, a silver fish would dart past them and break the spell. The waters themselves seemed to be holding their breath as the boat chugged towards an unknown destiny. The team could only imagine what the claustrophobic depths might be clinging onto. This was a treasure that was so incredible that the company dare not advertise what it was that they were after. They couldn't get Canada's hopes up in case it all turned out to be a myth. They wouldn't even tell the team what they were looking for. The secrecy serves to excite the team beyond measure. They knew that they were on the lookout for something that would have a huge potential impact on the world. So, what's the story? Well, we can tell you what our team knew as they knitted up for a deep, dangerous dive. In 1950, some locals reported seeing something at the lake, and as soon as they spotted it, they vanished. Now, we know this probably caused you to have more questions than answers, but that is exactly what the team felt. Over half a century had passed since the strange object or objects had been spotted. What could the residents around the lake possibly have seen? The strange occurrence was over in a flash, not giving them time to register what the object could have been. The scene was a blur to everyone, but the impact it had was a long-standing one. Such an odd happening couldn't be shaken off and the witnesses would replay the blurred images over and over again in the years that followed. It was an itch on their consciousness that they wanted to be scratched. And now their opportunity had come. The Raise the Arrow team had come to demystify the legend. The locals were eager to tell their stories and describe the scene that they remembered so well. The thing, whatever it was, was completely alien to the residents' understanding. They couldn't explain anything much more than its inherent strangeness. What anybody didn't expect was that things were about to get even stranger. The event had turned into somewhat of a war, and the witnesses weren't happy to point out where the incident occurred. They took the team out to the lake's edge and indicated an area around a mile from the shore. This was the site at last the team knew where to start their grand adventure. They were intrepid explorers, pushing the boundaries of human knowledge. It was time to go now. 
This starting point was to be Point Peter on the northeastern shores of Lake Ontario. Point Peter is in Prince Edwards County in Canada's Ontario province. It's a pleasant area on a peninsula jetting out into the lake. Point Peter is a wildlife conservation area. It has no urban areas nearby, but it's a popular tourist attraction. The area boasts beautiful pebble beaches, limestone formations, and hidden rock cliffs. Lakes attract legends. Taking a large body of difficult to explore water, and locals will populate it with all sorts of items and even characters. Take Loch Ness, for example. In the highlands of Scotland, Loch Ness is one of the deepest and murkiest lakes in the UK. It is a home many believe of Loch Ness's monster, affectionately called Nessie by residents. Is Nessie really there? Scientists have called it a hoax, but there have been an awful lot of sightings. Loch Ness is the largest water body in the British Isle. There's just no way that we can tell for sure. Lake Ontario is no stranger to rumors as well. In 2013, there was another popular story doing the rounds. It told a tale of an alien base established under the lake surface. Maybe that could be the source of the strange disappearing object. The team didn't think so. The idea of an alien base nestled among the weeds was certainly interesting. But in reality, unlikely. Unless you're going to count octopi as aliens. Earth hasn't yet been discovered by other planetary beings. Why is Lake Ontario in particular shrouded in mystery? Well, it is one of the five great lakes of North America, with shores in both Canada and the US. Its name means Lake of Shining Waters. It is the smallest of the Great Lakes, although still the 13th largest lake in the world. At the end of the Great Lake chain, Lake Ontario is the lowest at 243 feet above sea level. The lake was carved out by Wisconsin ice sheet during the last ice age. At one point, the lake was actually a bay on the Atlantic Ocean. You can see dry beaches and banks up to 25 miles from the current shores, tracing the changes of the lake over the millennia. With the weight of the glaciers gone, the plates floating on the lava inside the globe are still bouncing back upwards. As the land rises out of the water, it tips a little, and inhabitants of the southern shores lose a bit of their land to the hungry ripples. 634 miles of shoreline surround the waters of the lake. A further 78 miles outline its many islands. At its deepest, it's 330 fathoms to the bottom. Due to its depth, it never completely freezes in winter. The lake is fed by 10 rivers, including the Niagara River, waters tumbling down from the famous waterfall to the southeast. Those waters leave by the St. Lawrence River, stretching northeast on its way to the Atlantic Ocean. Cities border the shores of Lake Ontario, most notably Toronto on the Canadian side and Rochester on the U.S. side. But most of the lake is home to large wetland, which support a varied ensemble of plants and animal species. Sadly, the once wildlife haven has been destroyed due to the pollution and deforestation, which have depleted many of the species native to the area. Nowadays, the wetlands and forests surrounding the lakes are protected areas. Lake Ontario's shores are thousands of years old. They contain nearly 400 cubic miles of dark, secretive water. They stretch across the border of two great nations. The task before the team was of biblical proportions, but they had help. Meet Thunderfish. This cute little craft is an automatic underwater vehicle and a mini submarine. It's pretty much a drone that swims instead of flies. Its camera is a sonar device that can take high-resolution images of the environment surrounding it. No one is living in the yellow submarine, though. The team remained on dry land while piloting it around the designated area of the lake bed. And the thunder fish delivered. It sent wonderful images back to the gloating masters. Well, what did they see? What stories were put to the side now, there would be no made-up monsters, no alien invasions. They didn't know what they were looking for. But there could be no doubt that the sonar images in front of them showed something. What was appearing on the screens before them? What could the nifty little probe be looking at? Fathoms below them? The team craned forward over the images, trying to make some sense of them. As if they were squinting just right at a 3D picture, suddenly the shapes fell into place for the team, and it was not what everyone was expecting. It was an aircraft, but it was just an old aircraft. This was one special. How, how special? Well, we hear you ask. Let's do a little bit of time traveling. We can spot an aircraft new and shiny, not yet wet. Let's peer in the window of a hangar, somewhere in Canada owned by the government in 1946. The Second World War had just ended, but tensions between the Eastern and Western blocks were high. Each side were looking for an edge over the other. The Canadian government was pinning its hopes on a new jet fighter with serious destructive capabilities. The Cold War was beginning, 
Both sides were eager to gain a military advantage over the other in the event of a large-scale battle. The war ended in 1991 without such an encounter ever happening, thus earning its title, the Cold War. For over 40 years, the threat of invasion hung over the world. On one side, the Western Bloc, generally democratic, headed by the U.S., on the other side, the Eastern Bloc, the Communist, headed by the USSR. The emerging Third World countries tried desperately to stay neutral. Both East and West possessed the power to alienate vast areas of land with one atomic bomb. No one really wanted this to happen, and it was the threat from both sides that kept the other from attacking. Nevertheless, the only way to feel safe was with good old-fashioned firepower. The Soviets started building aircraft that could carry their weapons over the Arctic to the US and Canada. Canada saw the Soviet activity and raised one Canadian company, Avro Canada Limited. Now known as Avro Canada, these were the engineers assigned to creating aircrafts that could beat back the Russian threat. And they delivered on the promise. In 1953, the Avro CF-100 Canuck was born. It was christened the Klung and it remained on active service in the Canadian military until the 1980s. In 1952, as they were developing Old Klung, the Royal Canadian Air Force received new intelligence. The Russians were upping the stakes once more. They were developing another aircraft. It was rumored to be a high-tech, high-speed, high-destruction animal that could wipe out the Canadian nation. But it would take the Soviets seven years to perfect it. That meant Canada had some time and she put it to good use. In 1953, the Klunk set out on her launch flight. Whilst people of note were saluting her, shadowy heads were already down, studying blueprints of her successor. The RCAF already had formulated a report in 1952 detailing how they could improve the Kinnock. It was called the RCAF's final report for the all-weather interceptor requirement steam. All-weather interceptor didn't exactly roll off the tongue, though, so AV Row Canada called it the Avro Arrow. She was everything that the name invoked. The Aero Canada CF-105 Aero was a supersonic interceptor. With its delta wings, it looked like a spearhead. And it flew as one, true and deadly. The main specification improvements were in strength and speed. This baby could reach heights about 50,000 feet. She could fly at Mach 2 speeds. Mach 2 sounds pretty impressive. And when you think of it, it's equal to 1,500 miles per hour. You can see why. Now back in the days, there were no computer simulation models to test theories with. No engineers in those days had to make model prototypes. Before testing with these prototypes, it was impossible to know whether the theories would hold together in the air. Between 1953 and 1957, nine prototypes of the Aero were constructed. They were perfect imitations of the hoped-for real thing, except that they were made to a smaller scale. The Aero was named for its distinctive delta wing design. Today, of course, we have seen Delta Wings and many aircrafts large and small. But back then, it was an innovative new concept, and it did a special job. The barrier that aircraft engineers had long struggled to overcome was that of the sound. The secret turned out to be in the wing shape. Delta Wings created wave drag, which creates an awful lot of complicated vortexes and forces that enable the plane to fly faster than the speed of sound. These cute little aircrafts turn out to really pack a punch. They reached Mark 1.7 before the glassy waters of Lake claimed their prize. The engineers had the information that they needed to move the design to the next stage. Surprisingly, little were to be tweaked based on the prototype's flight data. The wings were drooped and given a camber. A dock tooth was introduced. The newly published area rule principle was applied, leading to changes such as a sharper nose and the addition of a tail cone. The Avro Canada CF-105 Aero was rolled out in October 1957. The plane bore the Mark RL-201. It was to be a grand occasion, marking a turnaround in Canadian defences. 13,000 guests were invited in the prestigious occasion. But the Soviet Union, not to be outdone, defeated the Aero before it even got off the ground. They launched Sputnik, the world's first artificial Earth satellite. This was far more exciting than a mere plane. The Aero was a well-designed aircraft in a way of endearing. It pushed the boundaries of flight as we knew it. But it was in the wrong place at the wrong time. With one move, the USSR had changed the Western world's priorities. Political changes heralded the demise of the Aero. The government changed hands and new treaties were signed with the US. Most importantly, the arrival of Sputnik on the scene meant that there was now a threat from even higher up. The country could not afford defensive system against both manned bombers and possible ballistic attacks from the space. This meant that Canada would have to make a choice, and it was in good news for the Aero. 
they went down fighting with various government and military officials who locked in to cancel the scheme. But in the end, ballistic missiles were deemed to be the greater threat. Canada installed the bomb arc system and the aero program was cancelled in 1959. The cancellation of the program resulted in nearly 50,000 people put out of work overnight. On top of that, all the planes, their parts, equipment and Delta were destroyed to protect the government. The Canadian mounted police suspected a Soviet mole in Avico, Canada and wanted all evidence disposed of, but they had forgotten about the nine prototypes buried in the bed of Lake Ontario. The government destroyed all the drawings, models, and burnt everything so it wasn't replicated. David Shear, senior engineer, told the National Post that these models at the bottom of the Lake Ontario are the only intact pieces of that whole program. David works for Crack and Sonar, one of the companies that provide equipment for the project known as Raise the Arrow, organized by OEX Recovery Group Incorporated. It was Crack and Sonar himself who gave the team their thunder fish to capture images for the project. It was this submarine drone that took the first faithful picture of the prototypes. Back in the 50s, there was no computer modeling to see how they'd fly, so the designers had to use physical models. Then it went back to the engineers for fine-tuning. The ninth model is the Holy Grail. They had it perfected. John Brzezinski is the president, CEO, and director of Fosisco Mining, another company involved in the Raise the Arrow project. He's excited about the prospect of bringing these unique aircraft back to the surface. As professional explorers in the mining business, we initiated this program about a year ago with the idea of bringing back a piece of lost Canadian history to the Canadian public. People ask, well, do you think you are going to find them? David Shear, Kraken's Vice President of Engineering, told The Globe and Mail, the problem isn't the technology. The problem is making sure you are looking in the right place. The area off the shores of Point Peter seemed like a sensible place to start. After all, that's where the prototypes were launched all those years ago. This common sense answer was all bringing them quite good luck. According to Brzezinski, due to their pinpointed location, the team was confident that they would find something very early in their search. We're starting with the high probability areas, he told the CBC TV. They had done their research well. You won't have to wait for a week or months, this will be within days, he insisted. The media was stunned at how fast they found what they were looking for. Twelve days of hard work later, Brzezinski was back. Well, we have found one, he exclaimed excitedly. It was late July when the team got their proof that the aircraft was indeed under the lake. But the prototypes were destined to spend a few more months in the quiet resting place before they could be raised. The world could not get their first glimpse of the amazing artifact until 2018. History was nonetheless coming to life in front of us. The prospects of raising the arrows was super exciting. David was as enthusiastic about the discovery as his colleague John. I think being able to showcase using cutting-edge Canadian technology, being our sonar systems and underwater vehicle, to actually find a resurrect cutting-edge Canadian technology, I think it's an amazing example of what we can do as Canadians look back at our history. The delay in bringing the prototypes back to light was quite a bummer, especially since the team had found all nine of the aircraft. Of course, they were determined to get the whole set. The prototype that was missing was the ninth to be made. It was the most advanced, the most like the eventual aircraft proper would be. It had to be there. The team just needed more time. It hadn't taken long to find the first eight prototypes. It was huge in use. The aircraft is part of Canadian history. Only six of the finished aircrafts were made and all destroyed. Being able to see the trailblazing aircraft would be amazing. The Delta Wing was a relatively new concept at that point. So it required a lot of testing to determine whether it would perform well, particularly at supersonic speeds, said Aaron Gregory from the Canadian Aviation and Space Museum. Their expedition was finally coming to a close. A year flew by, most of it full of excitement, disbelief, struggle, and the pain and hard work. They had achieved what they had set their minds to. We're pleased to announce that the first historic relic of the Aero Free Flight program has been recovered, their Facebook page proclaimed. It was delivered back to land at CFB Trenton on August 13, 2018, after resting on the bed of Lake Ontario for 64 years.